<laughs> Hi, this is Mitchell Levy, global credibility expert. And I am excited to have Diana Boer here with me. And, you know, the, the show is focused on leaders living their values. And, and I remember spending time on a couple of different uh, occasions with you, Diana, and really enjoying seeing you. And when I say seeing you, seeing you and getting to feel your true energy, not the BS marketing stuff that we do, but really seeing you. And, and so I, I just would love those who, who join us, who play with us here to, um, to see you as well. So who are you? Hi. Oh, well, it's great to be with you, Mitchell. And yes, we have talked about several of those values. I guess I would just start with a bunch of labels. Um, I think of myself probably more often now as a wife and as a daughter with my aging parents, at 95 and 97. Um, grandmother, I've got really active kids that I stay up with. Um, author, speaker, coach, uh, book coach, and then communication coach and consultant. Um, that, that's a lot of the labels like board members for nonprofits, uh, Christian. Uh, those are some labels I'll throw out. Mm. Hmm. And God, I like those labels. It's interesting to, to, to think about your, yourself or to say it that way. If somebody's engaging with you, what does that mean? What do they see? Who do they see? Well, um, the most frequently people comment on the books. I've written uh, 49 books, pub all published with major publishers. And so that's the first thing. They call me the book lady for most people. Oh, yeah. I mean, even when people, I see them in the mall. Oh, yeah. I, I can't remember your name, but you're that book lady. So I guess that's probably what I'm most known for, just working with entrepreneurs who want to gain, you know, expanded expand their message, gain, uh, gain more visibility and wider influence. So I'm helping them a lot publish books. And I guess the, the second life that I use, I go back and forth between two, is when I'm talking to corporations. And I tell them if they uh, are not leaving the right message, they have trouble communicating internally, I can help them with that. So a lot of my writing is to help them uh, rather than just do a, me a message dump you know, for their own employees or their clients or say, go read it on the on the website. I help them communicate what they want to get across very clearly. Tell me about that. What does that mean to you when you engage with a corporation? Actually, here's a great one. A corporation comes your way and they want to engage with you, but you actually see that they're not really living their values. How do we how do you deal with that? I am very practical. I, you know, I just line up. If you're not communicating clearly here, are the things that frustrate people, uh, too many copies on their emails, or you give briefings, your guys give briefings to the leadership team, and it's all slides, dumped, not interpreted. You know, I will go through very specific things that I see and say, here's a solution to that. So they usually think of me as the solution provider for communication problems. Uh, to be even more specific, it, it changes, of course, when I'm talking to different groups. But if I were talking to somebody and they were complaining about their sales in their organization, I would say, you know, how comfortable do your people feel when they go into the C-suite and talk to a really senior executive about some product or service you're selling? And they, they will typically say, oh, not very comfortable. They don't like to call it that level or they, they don't do well at that level. And so then that's when I can say, well, the solution to that is having a stronger executive presence. They need to, to engage on the same level. So those are specific ways that I might engage with different people according to what I, what they're telling me is their issue or their problem or their, you know, what they're trying to achieve. And what happens in situations? So let's say I, I'm, I'm trying to think about a particular situation that 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 isn't your standard answer, right? I don't mean you, but our standard answer. So, and and because we do such similar things, which is absolutely beautiful. What happens when we get approached by a company that really needs us, either of us, and and then what happens is there's a prescription of of where we want to see them go because they're not actually actively living their values. When do we say, no, you're not a good client? I have done that often. 
uh, when someone would call and ask me for presentation training and they would say, uh, we don't really care uh, how they deliver it. We're just interested in their content. These are scientists. And I said, well, <laughs> I'm not your person <laughs> because how you deliver something is equally important to what you're saying to them. Because if they don't believe you or trust you, they're not going to believe the content. So I would have to turn that, that client down. Um, if I don't think I can help them, if I, they may not be expressing that they may be expressing their idea very poorly. They don't really know what they want. And sometimes I'll have to read between the lines and saying, are you asking me to do such and such? And they might say, well, I really don't know. Now I could take advantage of them and I could take their money, but I don't engage with that kind of client because I want to make sure that I have the answer, the practical ideas and solutions that they can use. And if that's not a good fit, it won't be a long-term relationship. Mm. Yeah. I, I, for me, it's really interesting when sometimes people are saying, I use the, I often use the word marketing cookie cutter approach. They'll come into you and they'll say, I need you to do this. And it's what everyone else and their brother is doing. And you're like, and, and, and the answer is we could do that, but what if it, they don't believe, right? And so there's, there's a very interesting fine line for me because I, I won't cross, I, I'll never cross that line. If I can't help somebody deliver a message, if they don't believe in it, they're just doing it because they want other people to think they believe it. Right. I think that they, I hmm. think they can tell when you know that you can help them. And when they you're just giving out that marketing message, I, I'm thinking of a major defense firm that came to me and said, we have the admiral coming down to, uh, I won't name the city, you'll recognize the company, every so every six months or so for us to give a briefing on how we're doing as we uh, deliver this product. And they get asked, the, the presentations are fine, but they get asked questions and that throws them and they sound like they don't know what they're doing. Can you help them? And that immediately adds, absolutely, here are 10 of the toughest type questions and here's the answer. And I remember that engagement and that client walked out and said, oh, by the way, how much is this going to cost me? I mean, he had already made up his mind. We'd already set a date without him even thinking about how much it would cost because we knew that there was a connection. His solution, I mean, his, his issue matched nice. my solution. But I will walk away if I don't have that kind of connection because I don't I don't want to take somebody's money when I can't solve a problem. And and to me, this is values. This is this is credibility. What? So thinking about values, do you have different values in how you uh, in what you share in in when you're working versus when you're grandma or mom or daughter? No, I don't think I do. Um, uh, by the I, way, I think that was a loaded trick question. Um, <laughs> my family, uh, I would say my my family's first priority and my clients know this because I, I make friends with my clients. They, they know mm. about my family. I, I ask about theirs. So that's that's extremely important to me to take care of my parents, to take care of my kids, my grandkids, etc. Be there for them. Uh, friends are very important. So I try to instead of spending my life on the road. Yeah, I began in my training business to hire a lot of other people to go do my programs so that I could be home more just because I missed friendships. You know, we have a lot of people over to our house often. We're often having parties and 50 or 60 people here. Uh, I, I love that. Uh, my faith is important to me. So I, I am very active in my church and I serve on a lot of nonprofit boards. One now that's about building character in kids when they're age three through six. Uh, generosity is another value that I have. And I think that applies to your time. I think it applies to your finances. I think it applies to your expertise. And so, um, you know, when I'm talking about generosity, like I said, in the money situation, you know, we have a pretty significant percentage that we that we give to charity every every year. Um, time, I spend a lot of time right now, I'm working on a, a veterans project. I think that pretty soon all those veterans from World War II and Vietnam and Korean War are going to be gone. And I am doing interviews with them now and writing up their stories. We're compiling it in a book. Um, that's one project. And that's to me, that's generosity of time. Um, and then I think that uh, you can be generous with your expertise. I know 
I have a lot of colleagues who call me about publishing, you know, wh which way should I go and how do I market and help me with my concept, etc. And I don't always charge them. It, uh, sometimes I do, obviously, if it's a long, a long drawn out, a real project, but talking to somebody uh, that I know that my friends, I want to share expertise. So I think all of that comes out under the banner, as you spoke about uh, generosity. Mm. I admire other people who are generous and I, I, I really admire that trait in a lot of people and see it in a lot of people. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think I use the word servant leadership when I, when I hear you say that. And, and I'm just, I'm trying to think of servant leadership and having the intent and commitment to do the right thing, which is really of being of service and, and something you love doing. You obviously love doing this. Right, I do. I, I even when I have friends who are changing jobs, and they want, hey, would you read over this resume? Or I'm getting ready to publish this white paper. It's really important to my next promotion. Would you look at it? Um, I, I'm happy to do that, and I see a lot of people who are generous with their time, and uh, that makes the world better. I, another value you ask about several values. Another value I have is just continual learning. I. I listen to a lot of podcasts, read a lot of articles, I'm always reading a book, um, even though I am on the, the upper echelon of my career, or the ending part of my career, so to speak, I've been in the business world for uh, more than three decades, almost four decades. I, I, there's just so much I don't know. <laughs> and so I'm always looking uh, outside my area of expertise, which is publishing, book writing, communication. I, I like being broader than that in what I'm learning. I, I, uh, I'm going to ask a question. I have a particular answer that I do when, when somebody, let's say somebody you, you already know, or you, you, you trust them, you know them, you like them and, and they send you unsolicited, they send you their manuscript or their table of contents or their book title. And they say, what do you think? I have an idea of what I say. What is the first thing you say? I usually ask what their deadline is. And uh, I, might, I might ask what they're, but if I don't know them, if they're a good friend, it's totally different. But, uh, you know, just somebody I, I know in the business world, and what their deadline is and what their budget for the project, then I either tell them I, I can do it or or I can't do it for that amount or in this time frame. Um, people sometimes, I think, ask um in a demanding way, which I, I don't like, they don't realize, I think that reading through somebody's manuscript, uh, and you know this Mitchell from your publishing company, when you when somebody ask you to read a manuscript, that's four, five, six hours of your time. And when they don't reciprocate in any way, or even offer to reciprocate, uh, I think that's past a boundary. It's just like going to a party and you've got to ask a legal question. You pull the lawyer over to the side. Hey, I don't want to pay your $600 fee at your office. I'm going to catch this party and take advantage. And I think that is taking advantage. Yeah. 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 You have 15 minutes and they send you a bill for 150 bucks. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, sometimes when a friend says, so for me, sometimes a friend says, Hey, can you look at the table of contents? And, and, and this was before I would think about saying, hey, here, here would be the fee to review it. For me, what's always interesting to me is I always ask the question, and many people don't know the answer. So I'm just kind of curious if you if you see this yourself. The question I often ask is, what do you want to do with the book? What's its, What is the main goal? That is a baseline question. Yes, because some people... Uh, the authors will come to you and say, I, I just want something to sell in the back of the room. I speak a lot. I'm always, you know, giving out these books. I just want something that I can produce really cheaply, sell at the back of the room. And that's it. Other times people say, no, I'm trying to launch a company on this. I want a huge representation. I want this sold in many, many countries. And I want to get a lot of media and visibility. Then that's, that's a whole different thing that you're discussing with them. And you have to you know, shape the idea for those goals. Sometimes people say, oh, I'm just writing a book for my family. It's it's my legacy I want to leave behind. Well, that's a whole different path and way of thinking and you budget differently, et cetera. But if somebody says, I, I'm i writing because it's important to me to give this message, no matter how popular it is, I don't care if I get media on it, I want this message out to everybody I can get it to, then that's a different, that's a different thing. 
but primarily my clients, uh, if you're specifically, I'm looking for those who want to publish with the major publishers. So their book will be reviewed around the world in a lot of major you know, outlets and they sell in foreign countries and not just focusing on the United States. They want to really get a big advance. That's, that's the kind of person I seek out as a client, but I can help those that come to me by referrals. I'm always referring them to somebody else according to the goal, but knowing what they really want is really important. And you said it right, Mitchell, when you said a lot of people don't know, they've never thought, why am I doing this book? I, it's interesting because to me, part of living your values. I mean, so here's what you've said. So yeah, I love the generosity. I love the the continual lifelong learning, the servant leadership, you know, and in your level of authority, your servant leadership is helping people think about what you and I might consider the most basic questions. But, but what I heard you say, let me tell you what I heard between the lines, you mentioned at least three different positive go-to strategies that all require different approaches. You hadn't even mentioned the negative ones you're going to say no to. Right. right. And so it's, just, it's, it's, it, and, and maybe it's because we're talking shorthand, but it's what I, this is the person who I thought I would see when I was interviewing you is somebody who's just transparent and, and someone who cares about the person on the other side. I do. I, I just don't want to deceive anyone. And, that, and in publishing, they could be easily deceived because a lot of people don't know what happens behind the scenes and what I called. And I have a friend calls them predators, publishing predators. Uh, they don't know a lot about it and you could take advantage of them if you want. So the kind of client, what I would turn down is uh, I had somebody, she's in her late eighties and she asked me about uh, publishing a book. And I'm thinking, no, I'm helping people sell it to a major publisher. She's not a, client for me. I will help her. She wanted me to comment on her writing. I commented on her writing. I told her she wrote very well and I gave her some specifics. She wanted to know what ways to improve. I gave her here three tips that I see that could improve this. But I, I'm not your person because I don't want to deceive her to think she doesn't need a platform and authors need a platform to put behind their book and promotion and she's not going to do that. Uh, sometimes a person will come to me and say, I want, I want to self-publish this because I can make a lot more per book and I'm going to, I have a platform to sell from in my speeches. And I say, fine, I'm probably not your person because I don't know a lot about self-publishing. I haven't done it. I've done it 49 times with a major publisher, but not with a hybrid publisher or self-publisher. And I don't want to take your money if I can't help you. And so there, there are yeses and no's there that you have to make. And I think they have to do with ethics, really. So how have you agreed, by the way, how have you shared that value structure that you bring to your business? How do you share them with how did you share them with your kids? How, do you, how are you going to share them with your with your grandkids? Well, uh, I, I'm glad you asked that, Mitchell. I just wrote about 15 single pages of stories <laughs> to my grandkids. And I think they reveal my values. I was telling them, I told you I was a person of faith. And so I was telling them what I call God stories, things in my business, decisions I'd made about selling my training company, things that I, I prayed about and they happened. I wrote those to my grandkids and they responded very, hmm. very positively. They're in college hmm. now. Um, I think I pass that on to my clients when I ask about them and I ask about their kids and I, I care you know, what's happening in their family. And I remember it if I haven't worked with them for a year and I'm going back later to ask about those things. And I don't, I don't really make notes in my, you know, my customer management system, like a lot of people do about those personal things. I just remember them because I, I enjoy that person. And so um, I think if you can't enjoy the people you work with, then that's <laughs> you're in the wrong place or they're in the wrong place. Mm. So <laughs> so so true. Yeah, if you don't love what you're doing, it's time to, if you can, figure out something else to do. Yeah, and, and you know, a lot of friends of mine have retired. And particularly, I got this question when I sold my business about uh, two years now. I sold my training company. I still do the book coaching and, and authorship, etc. But I sold the training company, and I had so many friends ask, "Well, are you going to retire?" Well, why aren't you going to retire? And I, because I love, I love what I do. I'll probably be like Peter Drucker still writing when I'm 95 because that, if you enjoy it, 
you know, I know this is not a new concept because all the way back to Confucius, but if you enjoy what you do, I don't really consider it work. I, I'm working on a book right now. I love what I do. So I think that comes across and um, you, you have to be the same when people see you socially as when they're one on one with you or in a big group or when they're working with you on a project. Yes. <laughs> Can I just say yes? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I, that's always the answer for me too. As long as I can be of service, and and somebody wants to pay, so, I mean, payment could be something other than money, right? So as long as I can be recognized as someone of service, there's no reason to for me to ever retire. The part of Part of what happened in society, we're going to go slightly off track, but why some of our values are the way they are today. Part of what happened in society is we, we our educational system is built around uh, command and control structures, built around people going into factories and focusing on one thing in life. And, mm -hmm. and, and the, the, the great, a great lie was, oh, well, work your whole life, be work 100% for this company, you'll be able to retire and then do all the things you want to do when you're retired. So, so people have this conclusion that, that, okay, you're going to reach a pinnacle when you retire, you get to do everything else. But then guess what your purpose, this is what you're saying, I, I, by the way, I'm with you, your purpose, which is what you love doing that you're doing every day. If you can't do that, because you retired, then what else do you do? Right. That's the reason so many people who thought they were going to be in this dream world when they retire are not because their work was something they enjoyed. It gave them reason to get up in the morning. It gave them a chance to meet other people. Uh, it gave them a scorecard when they were earning money. And when they don't have that, a big part of that dream just melts away and they have a hard time finding where they're going to spend their time. That's the reason you mentioned uh, or you read about a lot of um, advisors and consultants to those who are retiring saying you need to prepare for that you need to plan what your day is going to look like or your year is going to look like before you actually step into retirement so i don't know when one day someday 10 years from now 20 40 years from now maybe i'll i'll have a, an idea of changing or slowing down but for now i just love so much what i do and working with people that uh, i don't consider it work nice so going back to those people who work with you and your company do you have a set of values that you've shared with them that they know, or is it just hanging out with you? Like what is, how have you done communicated that? I, I have done that. Yes. I spent a lot of time on that with my employees. Um, one of the values was it's something as simple as call people back, follow up. If you tell <laughs> them you're going to call them back, you call them back. If you told them you're going to ship the books to them for their class next you know, in two two days, it better go out the door in two days. You do what you say and you follow up and, and verify. Um, we always have had, I know there's some people who, who don't believe this old saying, the customer's always right, but we practice that. You know, if the client tells you that this is the way I want it, or this didn't happen, or this did happen, you believe them, you trust them until they pull the wool over your eyes, maybe the third or fourth time, and then you realize they're not trustworthy. But that was just... If, if anything got me upset, it was somebody not following up or not treating the customer right. They just had to say, I want to keep this relationship intact. And, and they did. I had great people who did that. To, to give an example, you know, I developed all these courses based on my books and I had other people out presenting them, other trainers and even speakers when they couldn't pay my fee. I had another speaker that I would send and those people would always spend extra time. You know, if they were supposed to be at the client side at, at seven to set up for an eight o'clock program, they were there at six or six thirty. You know, and if a client came up and asked them questions afterwards, five o'clock, that doesn't mean they were out the door. Sometimes they were staying an hour just to help an individual who was in that workshop. And they still have carried that on after I've sold my business and they're now working, you know, and with the other company that they all moved over to they still have those values. I meet with them occasionally. I, I try to treat them like family. I meet with one person I haven't worked with now in probably 10 years because she went to this other company and I still stay in touch with her. So um, nice. those two are the key, key things, following up and making sure you treat the customer right. E even if we didn't make any profit on the deal, even if it meant this, this, this two day program for, 
you know, whoever we're working for, IBM or Exxon or Rich Petroleum or whatever, even if it means we don't make any money on this, we are going to deliver what we said, no matter what happened or what, you know, how the client might have fouled up on their end or they didn't advertise it well, it's something. We're going to do what's right and deliver. You know, I have, it was really interesting. There was, there was somebody I interviewed and they said something. And in that context, I felt comfortable, but it's so, it's different than what you just said. So I'll, let me tell you why. And then we'll give you the context. His, one of the values to his company was the customer isn't always right. And that said, uh, very Christian, very servant leader focused. And my interpretation of that is sometimes the person who's asking for something, they're asking for something, but that's not really what they want. They, right there, do you know what I'm saying? Cause we, we had this, oh, this yeah. is sort of, okay. So <laughs> how does that, how does that res resonate with you? Well, I don't like to refute them, but what I try to do is to lead them to what I think they need rather than what they're asking for. Frequently, uh, somebody would come to us and say, we have a communication problem. And I'm thinking, no, after I asked these open-ended questions and I find it, no, this is not a communication problem at all. You've just got a problem with this vice president who's the head of this division. And if you get rid of that person uh, and change that management style over there, then people are going to start communicating. So I, I tried to not say you're wrong. You don't know what you need but through a series of questions to lead them to rethink strategically what they're trying to achieve, then we see if they're on the right path. Uh, because words can be deceiving. They have different meanings to different things. I mean, some. Uh, I'll give you a specific example on that. People would call us up and say, I wanted to schedule one of your negotiation programs. I know you, you have a, a program on com communication, uh, excuse me, in your communication umbrella that's on negotiation. When I start asking them questions, I discover they don't really want negotiation. They're just talking about interpersonal issues, you know, that like negotiating a deadline. And, and my negotiation is more about money and projects and quality standards, etc. So I have to say in a soft way, let's go through these questions here to decide if you really want to call it negotiation or if this is a interpersonal skills program and we would come to the right answer so the, i don't think the customer is always right in knowing what they need but i mean in our philosophy mm. the customer is always right in that mm. we want to do the right thing if they say something should have happened or did happen we believe them oh i love that actually that was perfect that was exactly what i was thinking about as you were saying it um, it's, uh, the customer, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm typing this one also in a LinkedIn at the same time, isn't right. Always right. In terms of what they need. I like but that, they're, mm -hmm. but they're always right in that they should be believed and treated with respect. And if they think that, uh, you know, that they were shortchanged in some way that, uh, something was going to be longer than it was or whatever. We make sure that they get that, if that makes sense. When we say that right. they're, they are right about this is what they perceive. This is, this could have happened. And so let's deliver, let's go the extra mile to, to meet that need. I love that. Thank you for that. I just, I just put that out there. Is there a question, Diana, that I should have asked that I didn't? Well, you ask about uh, generosity and what that meant specifically. Uh, that might apply to my entrepreneurs. I've been talking more about a big picture organization, but the way I apply that to the entrepreneurial professional people that are coming to me for book coaching, for example, is they, they pay for a three day program. But then I throw in, hey, I'll stay in touch with you for, for 12 months through this particular way. And hey, if you want me to introduce you to my agent, I'm happy to do that. If you want me to send a special letter to my editor at one of the different publishing houses to introduce you, I'm happy to do that. That's not something they paid for, but that's something that I consider part of the generosity give back um, concept or, or value. And I think that's, that's important. Hmm. I agree. 
it, I like it. Thank you. It's always so good to give more more than the person asked for. And so at least it's it goes with your your comment on integrity. Say what you do, do what you say, and then and then do a little bit more. Yeah, right. And my attorney <laughs> does that, even though he charges big, big bucks. You know, sometimes if I have a little question to ask him, it it's not on the it's not on the clock. And I appreciate that for other people. Hmm. I love that. So listen, if if this conversation got you super excited and you wanted to reach out to uh, Diana, what is Diana? What's the best way for people to reach out to you? Uh, probably my website, Boo like my last name. It's like Boo Her, except I hope <laughs> they don't do it with an H there, not a K. <laughs> BooResearch.com. And I've got different ways you can contact me there on the site. Awesome. Oh, thanks so much for sharing your your time and energy and insight with uh, with me today and putting it out there. I. I uh, thoroughly, and as I expected to, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation and, and feel better for it. So thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. All right. Hey, thanks for watching us. We'll see you at the next episode. You guys have a great rest of the day. Take care. Bye now.